from Microbe TV. This is Tweevo. This Week in Evolution, episode number 86, recorded on January 31st, 2023. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast on the biology behind what makes us tick. Joining me today from Salt Lake City, Nell Zeldi. Hey there, Vincent. Great to be with you in vivo. Um or live streaming, I guess is the way to say it. Um, and let me just kick off with uh, uh, an apology up front. We had a false alarm. We were meant to be recording or live streaming and <laughs> recording last week, and I had to pull the plug right at the last second. It was uh, there was an infectious microbe involved that was causing an ear infection in my toddler. And so right when we were meant to be on YouTube, I was instead in the pediatrician's office um, appearing at an ear that was inflamed. And so the good news is we caught it fast. The antibiotics still work and um, she's on the mend. So, and, and, I, and we're back here together uh, live streaming today with already- No worries. Did you 30... take samples for, for sequence analysis along the way, Nels? <laughs> That's right. Well, so there was an interesting <laughs> debate with the pediatrician between, is this a virus or a bacteria? Yeah, right. And um, I don't think, well, I think, um, we'll never know, except that it does seem there's a pretty strong correlation between starting that antibiotic and, you know, almost within 12 hours, she stopped complaining about her ear and was sort of raging around and up to her usual tricks. So I think it might have been bacterial. You know, um, man, many of these childhood ear infections are actually viral. Yeah. When I was, when we had young kids, uh, we, we used, they used to get treated with antimicrobials, but it turns out they're mostly ear infection, uh, viral infections, which I learned later from a pediatrician at Columbia, but I yep. don't know. Anyway, I'm glad everything's okay. It's good. We'll take it. So yeah. Um, how are things there in New York? I've heard, I've been, you know, reading the headlines that there's no snow. No, there's no snow. It was uh, really warm yesterday, but it's getting chill now again. Mm -hmm. I don't know what's going to happen, but right. I'm here in the warm incubator. Actually, it's too warm. <laughs> Uh -oh. Can't control the heat here. It's a it's one of those steam radiators with a valve. You turn it on or off, and oh, that's boy. it. <laughs> so yeah. I, it's a little warm, but everything's good. Uh, and I just want to um, welcome our moderators today. We actually have two new moderators that we've added to the clutch. We have Les. Thank you for coming, Les. We have Steph, and we have Tom, our regulars. And Fantastic. then we have Barb Mack, UK, who's a new mm -hmm. moderator. Welcome, and thank you for doing this. Wow. Uh, and Thanks, we Brian. also have um, a new uh, moderator, Peak Dunning Kruger, PDK. PDK. Now, PDK is an enzyme, isn't it, Nels? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Phosphodiester kinase or something? <laughs> Make it up. What the <laughs> hell? Yeah, just, yeah. <laughs> Welcome, wow, that, all of you. Yes. Yeah, that's awesome. And a quick note on that front Steph uh, got in touch with me. I meant to try to get a PDF of today's paper or ahead of time, and then with all of the personal microbiology um, ha didn't get my act together, but let's do that in the future. We can just yeah. reach out any time and we'll try to, to float um, for folks that want to, you know, literally follow along at home with the paper. Um, yeah. Totally in for that. So, and thank you all for being here. Should we go around the horn a little bit here, Vincent, and welcome in our uh, other. Yeah. Let's see here. Let's get down to. So besides that, we have Simon from, uh, Bay Area, where it might snow. Yeah. Speaking of snow, we've been getting, we, all your snow is here in the Western Rocky Mountains um, so is from it, California. I, to, I guess it's unusual to have snow in um, San Francisco, right? For sure. Yeah. I think what Seattle I, got some know? a bit earlier as well. It's, um, it's happening. We have, we have Nicola from Italy. Ciao, Nicola. Welcome. Good to see you. We have Matt. We don't know where Matt's from, but he's just talking about science uh, Claire is from the UK. There you go. Yeah. Uh, let's see. We've got, we got Peak as one of our mods. PDK, Helsinki. Hello, Helsinki. Ooh. Very cool. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, relatively warm there, minus one centigrade. Um, we got really cold here the last couple of days. There's a natural sinkhole about an hour's drive from where I'm podcasting at LD Lab Studios, where uh -huh. the temperature on the Fahrenheit scale is minus 60. That's not wind chill, by the way. That's Oh, that's cold. Uh, that's cold, yeah. Jan is uh, here. Uh, yep, thanks, Jan. I think Jan's in Italy, but I can't be sure about that. Uh, we have had, we have Philip. I don't know where Philip is. We have uh, 
Andrew from New Zealand. Welcome. Welcome back, Andrew. Peter's from Stockholm. Thanks for joining us again, Peter. Hey, Peter. Um, oh, Mavi is from Turkey. Wonderful. Welcome. What a What a great assortment. We got Alex from Kentucky. We have Hannah from Utah. <laughs> Welcome, oh, my Hannah. gosh. This is just great. Um, we have Terry Cojones. I don't know where Terry is from. We have Mary, who interrupted Daniel Griffin's update to come live. That's that's the way to go, man. You can always go back to the other. Yeah. Uh, Ga Gary's in Colorado. Mm, Matt is uh, in Woodside, California. There you go. David is in Miami. James awesome. is BC, Canada. Other shade is from Amsterdam. Man, I love this. So Jan is in Rome. 6C in Roma. Jeff is in Santa Barbara. Uh, Milos is in Serbia. Welcome. Oh, this is just great. Terry Cohone is in Berlin. Berlin, thank you. And Philip is in oh, Wales. Yeah, charity. Yeah, that Charité Virology, right. Uh, exactly. The home of uh, Christian Drosten, right? There you, there you go. Uh, Rima, Rima is from Iowa. Good to see you, Rima. <laughs> uh, our, our moderator, it's funny, he, he made this. He said, I'll be in and out. I have to go analyze Hamlet. <laughs> <laughs> That's Got to go write work. a paper. Yeah. Got to write a paper. Yeah. All right, Rima we have here. Here we have um, uh, Jan is from Vancouver Island. AJT is awesome. from PAC Northwest. Sina is from Iran. Welcome. Wow, welcome. Wow, that's welcome. very cool. Elizabeth from West Virginia, a little closer to home. Pure Tone from the Netherlands. And Maureen is from Ohio. Wow, there's 54, 55 people here. Maybe folks are like starved for microbe TV live stream. We haven't done a <laughs> live stream in a while. Yeah, hungry right. for a little Twivo, a little evolution. So James is in Colorado. Not too far from uh, Nails. You know, I was just thinking before, the first episode we ever did of Tuivo, I mispronounced yeah. your name. <laughs> the last name, yeah. And I think I was so nervous with just, you know, <laughs> podcasting. I didn't want to interrupt or something. So, yeah, we've come a long way, Vincent, 86 episodes later. Michigan. Someone said we need the time uh, number 100 in a good way. Yeah, that's for sure. We've got well, a few. You have to do something yeah. special, right? Yeah, agree. we got about a year and a half to to time this out. I think it's got to be, we're, we're got to meet some, it's a destination. That feels like a destination podcast where we. Yeah. We should go somewhere. somewhere. So yeah. for, for TWIF 1000, for TWIF 1000 is going to be in hmm. April. I'm, yeah, I'm well, trying to uh, book a, a theater here in the city and everybody's going to come. Great idea. All the hosts are coming and then people who want to come uh, can come. But I, I tried to get the Joyce theater last night. It's uh, it was a 400 seat theater here in Chelsea, wow, but it's booked yeah. because they have a dance uh, program there, but I'm trying yeah. some others. Fantastic. Oh, here's an, here's another moderator vanity. Welcome. Are you uh, on the ground or are you up in the air vanity? What's the story? <laughs> well, you got Let's a see. great bunch of moderators, everybody yeah, here to I keep agree. our 61 yeah, viewers in order. <laughs> That's right. There's a lot going on. There's a lot of conversations, multiple conversations unfolding right before our eyes. It's really fun. Yeah, right. Well, we better get underway. We've got some, um, if we're hungry for some science, let's let's dive right in. And I think this is going to be a, a really interesting one, a pretty fun one. We're going to go, you know, let's be honest, we're going to go a little bit deep into the weeds here on some probably semi, cert, certainly an esoteric critter um, into, in, into some somewhat esoteric uh, molecular biology here. But we'll go, we'll, we'll take it as it comes and try to respond um, and, and bring everyone into the conversation as we go. So the paper um, today, it's uh, recently published in the journal Nature, and the title is Short tRNA Anticodon Stem in Mutant ERF1 Allow Stop Codon Reassignment. And so, you know, already here we're into the alphabet soup, and that probably sounds like, um, <laughs> you know, not the English language um, the, it's certainly the science language here. And so this is going to take, I think, some unpacking. But um, we, I mean, we're going to be talking about a, or the fundamental process here of protein translation um, and how you can mess with that. So the idea that you can mess with this at all is pretty wild when you think about how important it is to take. So we're talking about the central dogma here, taking DNA to RNA to protein. Um, and, and you know, certainly this is like a massive triumph of evolution, but it turns out you can mess with it. Um, and that's what's going on here. So before we get into the... And, and try to unpack the science. Let's 
um, lift up some of the authors here. So this is uh, coming from the Czech Academy of Sciences, Institute of Parasitology. Um, uh, this is Julius uh, Lukesh, Lukesh's lab. Um, and first author, uh, Ambar Kachale, um, and then uh, a whole cast here um, from the Czech Republic um, who uh, put together this work. So the um, Lukash lab, pretty famous for, um, I would say, doing some kind of evolutionary off-roading here, taking creatures that might not be sort of um, high on the radar screen in terms of sort of the popular model systems that evolutionary biologists, geneticists, et cetera, developmental biologists um, deal with. But really, um, I think uh, being able to take these critters that don't live in the most sort of easy, they're not domesticatable. Um, they're out there um, in the wild, kind of living on the edge. Parasites, we'll be talking about uh, one in particular today where this um, uh, mutant ERF1 in short uh, tRNA anticodon leads to some gymnastics when it comes to translating proteins here. And so really, I think a remarkable group that are taking these systems that are really high degree of difficulty and squeezing sort of biological or evolutionary knowledge out of them, which are really impressive. Um, and speaking of uh, impressive and interesting, I think you put in a link here, um, Vincent, for the cover of the yeah. issue. Of the, we got to do, so this will, maybe this will help actually for us to start unpacking a little bit about what we're yeah, let me up show against this. here yeah. with the Very topic. Cool. Yeah. So um, I don't know if we can zoom in a little bit. Yeah, but let me <laughs> make it uh, a little bigger. <laughs> this it's a is small, great. It's so. a small uh, image that they put up. Nature is being cheap, you know. There well, you go. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, they don't want to use the pixels. But So if, if you're on the live stream, hopefully you can kind of read this. Um, and we'll put this up in the show notes as well, a, a link to it. But so... Um, actually, I'll just read it because I think it's, it's pretty fun. So imagine a gene is a sentence starting with a capital letter and ending with, ending with a full stop. And a genome is a book telling an entire story. In some protozoan organisms, extra full stops have infiltrated the sentences, replacing specific letters of arbitrary words, namely E and W, which <laughs> are the amino acids, uh, glutamate and, um, and uh, tryptophan. Okay, so then um, it's also kind of an eye test here, but so the as the, color, <laughs> the colors get darker, um, and but it gets worse, right? So as a result, now that e is replaced with a period; it's a stop or it's the end of a sentence. So I'm, you know, read for yourself here. It gets harder to read because each of the e's and w's have been replaced by periods, as if it's the end of a sentence. This is exactly um, what the protozoan that we'll be talking about um, has done with its genetic code. Um, but then as we get to the end of the, the cover here, the paragraph on the cover, um, the trick, so getting back to actually those uh, periods that are showing, the ends of the sentences that are showing up in the middle are now gone. And it says the trick lies in the length of the transfer RNA molecule and in this unique modification of a single protein that normally um, ensures dot recognition in cells. But, and then, so now as we move into the green part of the paragraph, by the interaction of these words modified molecules, the ribosome of this protozoan knows when to correctly terminate, notwithstanding the many dots. And so now those dots have turned back to E and W's. They've been recoded. Um, and when, uh, and the critter also knows when to replace the dots with the two original letters, which returns meaning to the genetic information. And then it ends with the proper period on the end of the cover. So that actually it's lovely. This is great. <laughs> very I mean, clever. We're kinda, yeah. We're kind of done. I mean, that's like, if you want a top so, level, to, yeah, that, there you go. So if you want to do some level, emails, some pics, what the hell? That's right. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Right. So, um, you know, so that's, hopefully that made sense for what was going on there and that analogy of using, um, protein translation. So this is messenger RNA turning into protein and decoding the mRNA, the codons into yeah. amino acids and putting it together in a sentence. If, that, if that's all you get from this, um, or, or, or if you actually, you know, if you um, find yourself a half an hour from now or so just confused and in the weeds, um, perhaps myself included on some of the details here, um, go back to that cover photo. Um, and that's basically the big picture here. You know, Nels, they notice they used full stop instead of a period. 
Well, it's yeah, a, so it's a British journal, right? <laughs> that's correct. Yeah, <laughs> these are we're an international show, Vincent, as we just saw from going yeah. around. Well, you don't use full stop, do you? You say period, right? Put a period there, correct. graduate student, yeah. right? That's right. That's fine. No, it's, it's absolutely fine. It's just <laughs> interesting for people who may not know what a full stop is, right? That's right. Yep. Yeah, and I guess this um, this is coming up. So, um, Steph, you you know, yeah, a very complex paper. Could we say a few words about the gist in, in simple terms? I think. That's maybe um, I would uh, you know applaud the authors sort of on that on the cover um, of the journal of making a simple attempt so that you know all of a sudden two letters turning into periods into turning into full stops and then um, figuring out how to uh, reassign or, or navigate through that is exactly what we'll be talking about. So what's what's a partial stop? If this is a full stop, what a comma would be a partial stop? And do you oh, call it a, yeah. a partial stop in the UK? In, in the UK system, yeah, maybe someone could weigh in. Like I'd imagine a semicolon that feels like a um, near stop or something. Uh, yeah, uh, certainly a pause. Um, okay. But Vincent, so let's, um, you know, move from grammar to biology for a minute, <laughs> if we could. Okay. <laughs> and, um, let's, I think it's worth it to do a little bit of protein translation kind of one Oh one, just to kind of get us on the same page a little bit here. So semicolon is, a, is, is, uh, the partial stop, partial stop. Okay. There we okay. go. Yep. So uh, genetic code and the evolution of the genetic code. So what is the genetic code? And so we kind of have already tap danced around this um, a little bit. And so this is that, again, that, you know, kind of the revolution of molecular biology from 50, 60, 70 years ago, as we figured out how do you, you know, what's going on with the structure of DNA, um, the, the notion that this is sort of a recipe book or has the information that's then um, expressed or, um, you know, used to animate our, our cells that then come together and give us the ability to, to have live streams on, on YouTube. And so really at that cellular level, right? So the, going from the, the genome that's, in, that's carried in, in the nucleus of each cell, um, moving that sort of stored information in the DNA to a more active form of the information, the messenger RNA, and that's through the process of transcription, which itself is a massively interesting and complicated process. Um, but then we go into from how do you take the messenger RNA and um, translate that into the proteins, the peptides and proteins that then do the work of cellular biology. And so right around that time, it was becoming actually as the code was cracked, and there are many books, great books on this, I probably won't be able to draw on a title or um, right off the top of my head. Um, but, you know, sort of reliving, like once you figured out how that code works, how codons, the three um, nucleotide letters in the messenger RNA that are detected and um, or are, or there's a binding, there's an interaction with, and we'll use some of this terminology, with an anticodon, um, which, which is a piece of RNA itself that folds into a kind of a funny shape, which is charged with amino acid. That's sort of the handoff between that codon to amino acid. That this is all happening at a set of pro or a complex of proteins, the ribosome. Um, and that's uh, sort of this, this process of adding one after another through um, covalent bonds. The, the messenger RNA is, is used as a template to then build a peptide to build a protein. And so the decoding was, uh, you know, I think pretty interesting um, in the sense that it's not to, it's, it's it's said to be a degenerate genetic code. We've talked about this on Twivo. So, and what that means basically is that for those three letters, you can have there's different sets of three letters that will encode for the same amino acid, and that's because there's 64 codons given the three combinations of four nucleotides, but there's only 21 or so amino acids. Do I have that right? Actually, or my is my uh, number yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. And so you know, that gives you a little bit of extra coding space. There's on average, like three ways to code for one amino acid. It turns out to be a little more complicated than that. And along the way, there's also three stop codons, right? So that's the full stop at the end of the sentence, as we saw uh, on the cover issue. Oh, here we go. So here's, yeah, here's actually a way of visualizing. Yeah. So maybe Vincent, why don't you um, step us through that process? Yeah. So this is from the textbook principles of virology. And actually I'm showing yeah. the, uh, termination process here because that's what's relevant yeah. uh, in this paper. But basically, you have your ribosome reading the uh, mRNA. The mRNA here is in green, uh, yeah. and uh, it's uh, making a polypeptide. And each amino acid, of course, is conjugated to a specific amino acid. Uh, and then the, the, the 
anticodon, as Nell says, which is the sequence on the tRNA, recognizes the, the codon uh, on the mRNA. And so here, you, the last amino acid has been put in. Uh, and, you know, as, as the ribosome shuffles down the mRNA, additional amino acids are put in. But occasionally, as Nell says, you get to a termination codon, and that's uh, the story of this paper. Here's one UAA where there's typically no tRNA that will recognize that, and, but today we're going to find out differently. Uh, right. But instead, a termination protein, ERF1 here, and that's the purple protein here, fits in. Now, notice ERF1 looks a bit like a tRNA. And in right. fact, here on the right is a structure of a yeast tRNA, and there's human ERF1, which mimics it. And so <laughs> ERF1 fits in there and, and uh, causes ch chain termination because you can't put any more uh, amino acids in. The, pre the protein is released, and, and that's uh, the end of protein synthesis. Yeah. It's Very wild. Cool. It's just yeah. wild. And we're still learning, right? That's the thing that's <laughs> incredible, that we're yeah. still bloody learning about this process. Exactly. And, and, and in this case, it's the microbe or this parasite uh, that's teaching us mm -hmm. of, yeah. of, of it's, it's learned how to sort of bend to the rules of the system in a sense, or to use this or, or for the system to work um, with some flexibility um, in some ways that aren't really clear. Why would you mess with something that's, why would you fix something that's not broken? But we'll kind of, you know, talk about that. I think that's a, a really fun part of the of the work is it can, it kind of really jogs your imagination about why there might be some evolutionary paths where you would yeah. basically take something that works and, and mess with it. Um, uh, and, and that those are the, the individuals in the population that have done that somehow are the ones that survive. And so it's all, again, you know, this can look when we show these machines and like, and you, as you were walking us through Vincent, I mean, you look at some, like how that protein, that, that terminating protein ERF1 mimics or, you know, appears like a TR. It's different. These are different molecules, these, those amino acids versus mm. nucleotides. And yet as they fold up, it's almost identical. And so, it, you know, just by looking at it, you almost have this sense of like, someone must have engineered this or, so, you know, how do you like match these things? And it's, you don't have you, it, the, you know, Darwinian style of evolution of trial and error gets us there. You don't have to invoke anything special. And yet yeah, now it's given enough that. time you can get anywhere. That's right. Yep. That's, that's also our motto for podcasting, right? <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Give us enough time. We'll get it right. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. You know, uh, and, um, sort of plug in and out as you, as you need be, or as your schedules dictate and, and catch us on the recording side if need be. But, um, yeah, so this, you know, this gets you pretty excited, um, in the sense that it's like, you know, this has worked out 50 years ago, just as you're saying, and yet here we are sort of learning new things. And that's what I think this paper does, um, and, and does quite well. Okay, so it's this isn't the first known rule breaker of the central dogma. Um, it's known that a lot of protists, so protozoans, these are critters often single cells, swimming around in um, you know aquatic environments, freshwater, ocean, all everything in between, mud puddles, um, have been known for decades actually to have non-standard genetic codes. And so one of the um, you know sort of um, poster ciliates for this is the model genetic system paramecium and, and um, distant cousin of it, tetrahymena. They only have one stop codon. So, and I guess we haven't really said this, but there's three codons, um, UGA, UAA, and UAG, that as you're pointing out in that diagram, Vincent, there's no TRN, charged tRNA to extend the amino acid mm -hmm. chain, the peptide chain. And so instead, um, when you in, mo, in in our cells, if there is a, uh, is, if the messenger RNA shows up with either of those three codons, the UAA, the UAG, or the UGA, and U is the uracil instead of the T from the DNA from going from DNA to RNA, um, then ERF one shows up and terminates, and that's the stop. That's the the um, the full pause. Yeah, um, full stop. The, <laughs> full stop in the sentence. Yeah, thank you. So, <laughs> so, um, and this was noticed, you know, pretty early as people were sequencing the genes from these critters where, you know, you saw these stop codons the same way we saw in those sentences on the cover. And instead of putting E's and W's, you'd, or you'd, you'd put an E, a glutamine um, mm. in place there. And so that's sort of a common substitution. It turns out there's now 30 known alterations. Um, a lot of these are um, kind of unearthed in bacterial genomes. There's also um, some substitutions in the mitochondrial genomes, which was an ancient symbiotic event where an ancestral uh, eukaryotic cell 
somehow grabbed um, a, a sort of bacteria-like uh, <laughs> cell um, at, at that stage. So um, That's a funny so, way to put it. Yeah, the, so the eukaryote either grabbed it or the prokaryote invaded the eukaryote, yeah, right? Or some of both. That's a, that's a whole other tuivo or, or a set of tuivos. That we've, we've, we've talked a little bit about symbiosis as well and, um, and, and how that's often framed or thought of. Um, but so if there are any common themes actually that are emerging from these known alterations, um, which we don't talk about very much, by the way, as geneticists or molecular biologists, even though this is really happening a lot, um, it's that stop um, the stop codons um, switch to sense. That's the most common alteration. So that's what we'll see today um, in the uh, species we'll introduce in a minute. That's what you see in a lot of these other um, systems. And so there's some kind of, you know, there's some interesting ideas about um, why that might happen um for so for example for the sense stop to sense um there there are these patterns and i think we'll, we might dig into this in a little bit but there's patterns of um just in a genome what the gc composition is and so again for nucleotides the the g's the c's the a's and the t's g's and c's are complementary a's and t's are complementary and people have noticed just as you start to sequence genes or even look now at whole genomes that even closely related um, species might have different GC compositions, meaning that just if you take an inventory of all of the nucleotides that make up the genome, hmm. that percent total in the kind of ledger there might be quite different. So you might have, you know, I think on the low end, there might be something like 20% uh, Gs and Cs, meaning you have 80% As and Ts, um, all the way to like 60% Gs and Cs, something in that kind of range. And so I haven't really, I don't know if you've seen anything convincing. I, I think it's still an open question. Why even closely related species might have such different um, nucleotide contents? So, certainly some ideas out there, but I don't know that that, I think that's sort of an open question of molecular biology, I would say. Yeah, okay. I, I, I don't know what that, what that means. It's really puzzling. Yep. Yeah. We might kind of scratch that a little bit here. Um, and in fact, so like if you don't, like, let's just stipulate, we don't know the reason, but it happens. And so if your genome over the course of, let's say, I don't know, hundred thousand years or something like that in your population, um, if you take, if you sample an individual from that population and say, okay, what's your GC content? Let's say it goes from 50% down to 35%. Um, over the course of some time, as you get more A's and T's, it's actually um, more likely that you'll hit a stop codon, right? Because these are sort of A rich, especially that UAA. And so, hey, remember? What, you know, uh, do you remember the names of them, Nels? Just <laughs> oh, they, oh yeah, yeah. Uh, so um, <laughs> amber, ochre, and umber, oh, umber. Uh, yeah, yeah. Tell us that story, Vincent. The sort of the history. Well, I, I, actually. I think uh, probably Tom would know the story better uh, than yeah. I, yeah. I but it, it, let's look it up. Uh, stop code on naming before Tom says anything. Yes, these are the these are the suppressors. I think that's part so of. So historically, amber was UAG, ochre was UAA, opal is uh, UGA. Um, and so I don't know what the first one was. I'm, I'm guessing that uh, you know it was somebody's kid or something like that, but I just don't know. <laughs> I don't, I mean, I, I remember learning this in my like intro. Oh, here we go. Class. Yes, here we go. So the first were uh, discovered by Richard Epstein and Charles Steinberg, named after their friend and graduate Caltech student, Harris Bernstein, whose last name means Amber in German, Bernstein. Amber. So this is um, funny because I was uh, at postdoc in David Baltimore's lab yep. with a student named Harris Bernstein, Bernstein. And uh -huh. he's not related, but he always say, "Just call me Amber." <laughs> <laughs> he's one of the. He was a stop codon. <laughs> it's and so funny, yeah. And so that was really the first is. one. Then the others just continued the tradition, right? right. Use the theme of the of the Amber Ochre. Yeah. Amber Ochre. Uh, so Amber was UAG is UAG. Ochre is UAA, and Opal or Umber is UGA. There we go. Yeah. Okay. There will be a quiz. Remember that. <laughs> It's a pop quiz. This also gets at, I mean, this is what I was sort of trying to hint at, sort of this fun history from, how many years ago is this now? How many decades ago is this? Well, the uh, first one was discovered in, um, well, that's a long time ago. Let's see. Yeah. Reference 16. That was 19. No, that's a that's a review article. I don't know. It's It's got to be the 60s, right? Yeah, exactly. Easily. So we're, yeah, so 70, 80 years ago. 
as in, in molecular biology, by the way, it was sort of a cottage industry. Now it's like this, you know, massive, um, sort of science industrial complex in terms of our numbers, <laughs> but, you, but back in the day, there are a few, few practitioners who are kind of doing this and bringing in sort of those personal, um, you know, ways of naming things, et cetera. So yeah, a really fun history worth checking out. Um, okay. But so anyway, so we're probably, I'm probably dragging us into the weeds already anyway, thinking about All right, like, my fault, I, my fault. No, no, no. I'm, I am kind of thinking about, so stop to sense is the most common substitution. Um, and in fact, there's, I'm going to kind of gloss through this a little bit, just sort of in the interest of time, but there's several hypotheses about how, what, like, how these changes might occur to the genetic code, the sort of bedrock of our molecular biology. How is it that some of these critters might tinker with this uh, and come up with sort of these substitutions, stop codons becoming sense or where you'd put a, you know, or uh, sorry, a uh, sense codon becoming a stop where you put what looks like um, uh, an interruption into your peptide when in fact you're putting a, an amino acid in there. So I'll just kind of quickly um, highlight um, a few of the ideas. So one is called codon capture. So how could, how could you make changes? And so in this case, the notion is that let's say a codon goes extinct. So, right. So, um, you know, you'll probably need our proteins across a proteome. You'll probably need all of those 21 amino acids, but not equally. And, and because there's degeneracy, so you can, you know, three codons might get you to a single amino acid. If you, if one goes extinct, you can still get to that amino acid through the other two codons. So let's say that happens. Then that sort of opens up space for evolution, to, some evolution to happen. For example, if another, so if that one goes extinct, but then through mutation, you change another codon so that it sort of reappears in some appreciable number um, among the coding regions of the genes in a genome, then it's possible that a anticodon that's charged with a different amino acid might recognize that sort of reappearing codon that was lost in time for a while. I don't know. That's not like to pull that off sounds <laughs> a, a, like a high bar to cross. So anyway, so that's one idea, it's sort of a drift um, notion. You, you don't need natural selection to really act if something is just sort of lost by chance, um, which is sort of an attractive, I think, part of that hypothesis. Um, the next one's called the ambiguous intermediate. This one maybe feels a little more plausible on its face. So it's basically now remember because the tRNA, so this is that part of mm -hmm. the interaction that folds up into that shape. It's charged with that amino acid. It's made of RNA. So it's, it's, it's subject to the mutational process as well. Um, and so, and that can happen at two levels, probably the most common, right, is the DNA that codes for the tRNA mutates, and then that gets mm -hmm. transcribed. Uh, you can have errors in, um, you know, our, um, um, nucleotide incorporation in a message as well, or in a, in a transfer RNA as well. If you, in the numbers, by the way, you know, as those sort of grow, that's also a possibility for the mutational process to unfold. So if that's true, you could imagine that there are mutations that would change the specificity of the tRNA. And we didn't really go into the weeds there or into the details, but that that's that complementarity of the anticodon with the codon and making that recognition event that's then going to pass that amino acid um, onto the onto the growing peptide chain. Um, and so if this happens, you, you could imagine that now some codons become deleterious. So that specificity has changed. So, you you know, selection has acted to purify a set of, of, of um, amino acids in the protein. All of a sudden, you're putting in different amino acids where you think there would be a, mm. um, a, a different identity there. And so then you would need, you know, natural selection to act on the sort of the backside of that to accommodate that. That, again, seems like a pretty tough road to me because, you know, anytime you're changing a, t a tRNA, that's a pretty, like, and that means a co like you've changed a codon's um, identity. That's sprinkled throughout every single, you know, protein in the whole proteome. Mm -hmm. in, in our cells, that might be 30,000 plus, um, uh, you know, events that are in multiple events in, in single peptides. And so how to the, the that seems like very deleterious in almost all cases. So another one that's sort of, sort of tough. There's another one called tRNA loss or tr you lose tRNAs and then you drive a reassignment in order to get back some of these. So anyway, that's sort of, I would say the sort of state of the art in terms of trying to come up with hypotheses about how the sort of the mechanics of how this work and how evolution might act or selection might act to allow these things to evolve. But I think truthfully, I would say that the field is still scratching their heads. It was sort of what you were saying, Vincent, was, you know, even though this biology has been known for decades, it's sort of like the details or, or even some of the core things going on here. We still have so much to learn about. Um, 
And, it, and in some sense, that's sort of like almost the like tragedy of the success is that we um, like it's su such a beautiful uh, notion of the genetic code or the, the you know yeah is is so kind of universal and simple and intuitive that we just sort of a lot of I think molecular biologists evolutionary biologists sort of stipulate oh that was solved many years right, ago and yet right, right? and yet well you know is, also this influences young people coming into the field they go ah you know it's translation why should I work on that but <laughs> Yep. And I think my, my impression is that not a lot of people work on these questions because no. in part of that, yet if you figure something out that you can do engineering that you couldn't do before and can yeah. be really useful. And, and, and as you said, in a bioengineering sense can be yeah. really useful. So I wouldn't throw away anything. In fact, I think um, people should be more broad in terms of what they're thinking about. Don't go for, don't go for the, you know, the sexy stuff that you think is, it's going to be great. <laughs> really go for the questions like this one where it's it's not solved yet. Solving it could be really have big implications. I agree. And it gets even worse, Vincent. So I, I have like a personal uh, ax to grind here when it comes to this topic. So when I was <laughs> kind of when I <laughs> when I was coming up as a grad student, <laughs> let's yeah. hear it. Let's hear it. <laughs> I'm trying to start to get my New York style going here a little bit. No. So I was when I was coming up as a grad student getting interested in evolution. Um, I was taking a class at this is at the University of Chicago. I was taking a class taught by Marty Kreitman and Manny One Long, two great evolutionary geneticists and, and great scientists, great people, by the way. Um, and so we, we were meant to do class projects. And I decided as sort of, uh, you know, certainly like kind of I was getting together my training in cell biology, but I was kind of in the I was pretty naive, to say the least, and still am, I think, to a large degree in evolutionary biology. But anyway, so my the project I want to do is the evolution of the genetic code. And I can mm -hmm. still remember, you know, this is now a couple decades ago and uh, Marty Kreitman saying to me, oh, well, that's really tough because that evolution happened so long ago, right? It was that sort of that bedrock notion. And when there are changes, so I was working on the ciliate um, cousin of paramecium called tetrahymena and it has a different genetic code. So that was sort of what got me onto that was like, well, how did, yeah, you know, just that yeah. curiosity, well, how did, you know, this model system that I'm using, how did it get there? And so, Marty's point is a good one in, in some sense, or it's, it's a very natural one, which is like, well, you know, it's really hard to get at the evolution that happened, let's say, a billion years ago compared to something that happened in, in sort of an evolutionary blink of an eye. Um, but in and, and his second point was that, well, you can't really do any experiments, right? Because like, how do you, you know, like go into that billion year ago time machine? Hmm. And so I think that's, you know, what's really exciting about this paper, about work like this is... We actually don't need a time machine. Like there, these these sort of modern creatures yeah. are coming to us and saying, "Hey, if you can just, I'm trying to tell you how you can mess with this system, yeah. but you have to figure out how to listen using the tools." Well, of, you have to get away yeah. from model organisms. That's a the key, that's right? right. Yeah, you, that's if, right. if you got it, 99 of the world studying E. coli, it, yeah, you're going to hit a wall at some point, right? Yeah, but if you go and get a true bug, <laughs> esks. Es, es, Isochorus aeneas from somewhere in the Czech Republic, yeah. you know, and tr isolate something from its hind gut. <laughs> but the thing is, if you wrote a grant to do that, you'd never get it. Well, that's right. And so this is, I think, why it's important <laughs> to have these conversations and and to try try to like continue to push for that crack sort of in the veneer of science, which is so the evolutionist would say 20 years ago, would say to you, don't even worry about it. Like that's impossible. Like it's, it's, it's really hard. Or if you pick that up, it's hard to make any progress. And I think that's what's really happened in the last 20 years is that we've kind of opened our eyes or starting to open our eyes that there's like, you're like, you're saying, go to these strange creatures out there. Don't be intimidated by the fact that there aren't those tools and, and see if you can just sort of chip away at that. And what can mm -hmm. we find out by doing that? And I think that's what this paper does really well. And that's, by the way, that's one of our organizing principles of Twivo is where are those sort of evolutionary ideas, those big ones, those fundamental principles, where does that collide with the ability to do experiments and to actually learn about these things and, and sort of break down what are the pressure points that, that evolution can tinker with? Collisions. Okay. collisions, collisions, collisions. Here we go. So we're, um, you know, more than a half hour in and we haven't even introduced the sort of star of the show, the star of, of this, which you're hinting at. This is a, so this is a, um, <clears throat> a, <laughs> a canidoplast protist. And so there might be some names that have come across people's radar here. So these are things like trypanosomes, leishmanias, and other parasites. So um, canidoplast is a structure that they all have in common, right? 
That's right. Yeah. Sort of a like off brand version of a mitochondria or something like that. Um, and so, um, so really wild biology, lots of modifications to the genetic code. Um, the species that they're exploring today is one they're actually named. So we're still, you know, this is also the discovery of the, of the creatures that are out there. This is so they, it's um, the genus is um, Blastocrithita, cr no, Crithidia, Blastocrithidia. I'll now be um, just calling it B. Um, but in the species, they named it um, Blastocrithidia nonstop. So B <laughs> nonstop. And I think that already <laughs> it's now named. There's a, there's a species named for, for its uh, uh, sort of gymnastics with the genetic code. And as you're, as you're saying the name of the species of the, the bug, that they isolated this parasite from its hindgut. Um, a a Sarcoris aneus. So, yeah, so that's, is, you know, we're really getting pretty obscure here. So we're in the hindgut of that bug, which, in, which is sort of the fleas on fleas. This is a parasite of a bug, um, B nonstop. And so anyway, how did they actually, how, so how did they get there? They're kind of messing around looking for to dis, discovery space to see um, what's out there and then sequencing genomes, right? And so when they sequence yeah. the genome of B nonstop, they noticed that all of the open reading frames actually had all three stop codons in coding regions. Hmm. And so, so that's back to the, <laughs> back to the cover. So you basically, you see an open reading frame, right? Yeah. yeah. You start with methionine and it keeps going and going. Yeah. And in the middle, when, where there's amino acid, there's a stop codon, right? That's Instead right. of ending the protein, which you would see by translating the, you see a stop codon. And then you see this enough and you start to scratch your head, right? <laughs> exactly. And you're, you know, maybe your first notion is, oh, well, maybe you just have a lot of short proteins, but no, you can't get away with this. Like there are enough, there's enough gene conservation and you need and enough stop codons that are showing up. If you're using all three, if the, all three stop codons are showing up in your message. Um, very soon you'll see that's not like, that's not a way forward. You can't sort of make all kinds of tiny little um, protein fragments. Although, you know, be open-minded. Maybe there's some weird like copying and pasting, like a whole nother machine where you take short peptides and then put them together. But we, we haven't seen that yet. But, but I um, think also you see the protein continues, right? Exactly. And in some cases for some length. So that exactly. wouldn't really, and there's no methionine, so it can't just yeah. stop and restart. Exactly. So that wouldn't work. Um, and so the, a much easier explanation for this is that all three of the stops have been changed to sense codons. Um, echoing a little bit of what's been seen in other ciliates, but taking it kind of to an extreme. So like paramecium, for example, two of the three are now um, uh, used to code for an amino acid. You still have the UGA is still a stop um, at the end of the message, but this um, B nonstop mm -hmm. creates a new problem because if all three of these are now um, used to code uh, sense to put in amino acid, then how do you stop it all? And so we'll, we'll return to that. Um, but so this is, you know, so very quickly, just given the, the same way that we put those E's and the W's back into the sentence, you can kind of infer what are the changes based again on gene conservation by comparing to other species that haven't done this um, uh, in some of the genes that are um, highly conserved some of that core machinery. And so um, very quickly, you can propose that UGA is um, instead of a stop codon is a tryptophan um, based on the amino acid you infer there. Um, and we'll get to sort of how that change, uh, how they sort of uh, got, found some evidence confirming that actually through some comparisons. Um, UAA is glutamate, um, but it also turns out to be a stop codon um, depending on the location in the messenger RNA. Um, and then UAG, and that actually, that will be sort of in some sense, I think the most interesting of the three that gets recoded is then, you know, you have to have this sort of now recognition of where you are in the open reading frame and how um, in the, that accumulation of um, or sort of extra stop codons perhaps in the neighborhood um, sort of uh, giving away some clues in that sense. And, and then and you need to have a, at least one stop code and otherwise you, you, it doesn't work. Or you just, yeah. Like that's right. And, and the cell actually has some ways of dealing with that. If there's so, if there are mutations, there's some quality control. And so if you just have run ons, then you very quickly get yourself into trouble. Yeah, exactly. Um, and then finally, UAG is also a glutamate. Um, and so if we go back to that cover issue there, you know, that's, those are the, the E's and W's, which is code for those two amino acids that sort yeah. of um, gives you a <laughs> sense of what's going on. Okay. 
So um, yeah, we already kind of talked about this idea of the GC to AT content. And so that kind of um, points to, as you move to more AT content, um, you'll just naturally, um, there'll be uh, the possibility of a lot more stop codons. And so that you could imagine then some selection for those to recode to actual amino right. acids to get right. away with that. Um, and so the other critters have done this like with two out of three, but have kept that third one sort of as a pristine stop codon. Um, probably not a coincidence that it's um, um, the uh, one that at, at least has one G in there. Um, uh, it, it, although there's two that could do that. So you could imagine that could have just been sort of a random um, choice between it. Um, but um, you know, there's some other things at play here and this gets a little bit, it's actually sort of the opposite side of the coin of the, the run on sentence um, scenario, but there's also this process of quality controlled called nonsense mediated decay. Um, and so um, basically this happens when um, uh, in the process of transcription, if a mistake is made um, and so your message actually stops prematurely, um, there's a set of proteins that can um, uh, recognize this or in concert with the ribosome and get rid of or decay these uh, messages that would otherwise, you, if you went on to translate a message that had a premature stop, you could launch all of these dominant acting short peptides that could just crash out the cell basically. And mm -hmm. so most eukaryotic cells have this NMD or nonsense mediated decay in place. That's actually, if you're um, one of these critters messing with your genetic code, that could um, sort of maroon you pretty quickly. Um, especially when you have all three stop codons sure. now coding for something, right? And so that was sort of one of the first prerequisites or helped to like build the case that, you know, you really are using all three stop codons to code is that it appears that nonsense media decay is lost in B nonstop, this parasite. Yeah. Let me um, put, bring up a question here because I think this is useful Great. at this point. Um, where is it? <laughs> Someone's trying to follow this without sound. I don't think that's a good idea. No. <laughs> All right. So, uh, other, <laughs> there you go. I'm trying to follow this with, it's not going out. I love it. <laughs> um, where is, heck, no, I don't want that one. Here we go. Other shade. Sorry. What again defines an open reading frame? Ah, great. So, that's yeah. a great question. Go ahead, Nels. Take it. Yeah. So, um, there's the, the, we've been talking about the kind of the closing of the sentence, but the opening is just as important, obviously. So, the um, ATG, a single codon, which codes for methionine, that's also called the start codon. And so that's always the opening word. Um, but to get to, you know, to get an ATG, um, which is in the, um, you know, so UAG in messenger RNA, uh, uh, or sorry, an AUG in messenger RNA and ATG in the DNA, to get there, you need to start transcribing. And so there's also, you know, when we think about open reading frames, we're also thinking about promoters. We're thinking about these sequences that recruit proteins into the act of transcription. Um, and that, that there's positioning there because there's, turns out there's also downstream methionines you use, you sort of, um, you're economizing here. There are parts of, um, peptides we're having several my, or additional methionines can be useful. And so that's, that's kind of the complexity of the biology here too, is how you determine what's the opening ATG. Yeah. And so that's sort of encoded in there. And then it's just as, as Vincent was showing in that great cartoon, the, the green message you're, you're putting in those little beads on a string of the, of the amino acids in the peptide, and then you get to the stop. And so that's that. And then, you know, the stop also, there's more information in the so-called three prime UTR or untranslated region, which help to coordinate that, making that decision about stopping and nonsense media decay. That's part of the quality control is, is how do you detect whether you're in the middle of an open reading frame in the middle of a coding gene versus if you're at the end. And so there's also some information um, in the way the messenger RNA is organized and how it folds that, that is helping to mediate that process. Did I get so, it? Yeah, that's, yeah. I mean, it, that's right. I mean, it's basically there's a methionine. Most of the time, there can be non methionine initiators. True. That's a good point. And then there's a stop codon. And in the early days, when we started generating genome sequences, we would put the sequences in a computer. We'd use a program to say, where's the open reading frame? So you have to give it some information. So it starts with the methionine. You tell the, the computer, find a methionine and find a stop codon. And then you want long ones. You don't want, 10 amino acids of that. So you, you look for longer ones. And that way you pick up your long open reading frame, start and stop. And 
Now, the, the key in this paper, and I love this part, they say, as existing annotation programs, so the program you get the computer that's looking at a sequence and giving you the proteins, open yeah. reading frames, it's an annotation program. Existing annotation programs could not handle ambiguous stop codons and be nonstop, right? Yeah, that's right. So it wouldn't, they wouldn't get it right, so they have to develop their own. <laughs> and, exactly. And apply what they think might be the rules, you know. Yeah, <laughs> and then once you do that, you could say, "All right, what what's the frequency of stop codons, and how does that correlate with proteins and so forth?" Uh, and they say here that out of seven thousand two hundred fifty nine predicted protein coding genes in B nonstop, only two hundred and twenty eight lack any in frame uh, UGA and UAR codons. Right, mm -hmm. in frame mm -hmm. stop codons. <laughs> it's incredible. Yeah, it's right. yeah. <laughs> yeah, and so that kind of also, I think, it illustrates how you know. I mean, so the annotation programs is like software in the lab that we just use routinely every day, and it will do the standard genetic code. But there's actually, you know, like on a Mac, there's a pull down menu, and you can say, oh yeah, use the ciliate nuclear code or use the yeah. mitochondrial <laughs> code. And, pull and that's down like menu. The, <laughs> that's right. That's the level of that's how much. The modern biologist thinks about this is it's a pull down menu if you're working with a weird there's no pull down menu for be nonstop. And so that's where yeah, you know yeah. this is sort of the frontier where you're kind of figuring it out. So so they actually will kind of maybe jump through this a little bit you know, somewhat in the interest of time. Um, but so they, you know, the um just by comparing to some of the other ways that some of the other um uh kinato kinetoplastids have done some of these substitutions, they can actually look and infer, for example, for the, um, you know, for the UAA and the UAG that appear to code for glutamate, um, you can just look at other systems. I think Leishmania, for example, that's a, a, a pretty popular or successful, I should say, parasite that we see in a lot of systems that, that the, those changes in the genetic code have already been sort of worked out. Here though, we're still stuck with that nonstop issue. Um, and so that's really where I think they dig in and really sink their teeth into it, um, into the experiments in an interesting way. So maybe we can go a little bit deeper um, onto that. So, um, so how you get the UGA to tryptophan is the part that's less clear. Um, and so, you know, knowing or, or starting to look at the composition of the tRNAs that, that are charged with tryptophan, um, then they could actually start just comparing the tRNA itself. And so, um, Vincent, you also showed that, that sort of, I don't know what it looks like. I, I mean, um, sort of the secondary structure of this. So that's meaning that the RNA is folding up. It's almost like a, a, a T shape situation or, a like, a, a there's three sort of branches coming off of this thing. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Oh yeah. Here it's we go. Right, so like that, yeah, that yeah, right yeast tRNA. So the T stem, there's the anticodon loop. That's where you're making those anticodon bases. That's where you're touching the codon. And then at the other end, you've got the um, amino acyl stem. Right. And so just looking at that secondary structure, they could compare this to other tRNAs for tryptophan. And there's a pretty glaring thing missing, which is in the anticodon stem. Um, uh, uh, yep, exactly where you're circling up. Yeah, sort right of, up here. T-stem, yeah. Exactly. Um, that instead of four bases, or sorry, instead of five bases, which are the standard um, tRNA, for B nonstop, there's only four bases. Um, and that's, there's, again, there's a sort of an echo in some of the other critters that mess with their stop codons. Oh, yeah, here, yeah, here they show right it. Right up there, yeah. Yeah, so where that arrow is in B nonstop, there's a missing, uh, there's a missing nucleotide. Um, and that's the case in the C magnum a little bit, but for yeast and others that you have that extra, um, I think T. brucei has this as well. And so, um, uh, so, th so that change, which is, um, uh, is, is pretty noticeable if you're sort of an aficionado of tRNAs, actually it was a clue to how this might've changed or be reassigned. And that's never been seen before, by the way. Like, so that, um, or that was, you know, they could compare, once I saw that, they could compare to other guys and say, actually, this might've happened more than once, but, um, for B nonstop, that's sort of the first observation of that loss yeah. in a tRNA. And so it's, again, this is sort of like messing with your, if it's a car's engine or something like you're messing with one of the pistons or something like that, basically. Cause yeah, you could, um, you could imagine that that could shift how the, anti-codon is interacting with the codon on the mRNA and right and make it not as stringent or whatever. That's right. Yeah. And so then um, there's also, you know, so accompanying this are some substitutions. So there's um, uh, another change, which is a C 
26U substitution and a U42 to G substitution in the tRNA. And so they also tested the impact of those. So what you can do here is um, use a, a reporter, a luciferase gene assay, where you mess with, like, so you basically propose, okay, here's, um, you know, here's a stop codon that you think might be become a tryptophan and use that tryptophan in luciferase as sort of a readout. So if you get it right, um, then you'll make luciferase. If you get it wrong, you'll probably get a stop codon and uh, it'll be, and then it will be, you know, degraded. You won't make a luciferase enzyme. And so then you can take um, these sort of uh, substitutions, either the deletion or those two substitutions, put those into a tRNA um, and then ask in your assay, does it, is it um, reassigning the code based on those changes? And so the answer for those substitutions in the deletion was yes. You get that tryptophan and you drive the luciferase reporter. Um, here's where then I think they, like it got pretty adventurous. So again, you know, that sort of um, courage to mess with the genetic code is to say, okay, well this, we, so B nonstop has sort of changed the rules um, for the um, UGA stop codon um, to now be a tryptophan can we mess, can we bring this into yeast or vice versa or mess with the yeast version, which is the canonical genetic code, the same genetic code that's in our cells and, and try to mimic those changes that be nonstop made and see what happens. They call this in the paper, a radical evolutionary twist. <laughs> <laughs> I like that turn of phrase. Okay. So, but they don't quite do this. So the way they decide to do this and I, that'd be fun to, you know, over, uh, um, you know, beers or something, talk to the authors of this, but they use T. brucii, um, this other kind of distant cousin of B nonstop. Um, and here, you know, probably like as close as you can get to a model system um, for some of the trypanosomes. Um, and so, and then they actually take the, the um, tRNAs from yeast, so a canonical one, make the substitutions that you see in B nonstop and put that, but you can't mess with B nonstop, you don't have the tools, but you can mess with brucii. And so they take mm -hmm. the modified yeast tRNAs, put that into the trypanosome brucii and ask, do you get that result that you see in B nonstop? Sort of mixing and matching this radical evolutionary twist to sort of plug and play with tRNAs now from um, the information from one species on top of a canonical one from yeast into T. brucii, where you have the tools to do that. And it kind of worked. So they've got, we won't yeah. drag you through the results, but suffice to say that, you know, you've kind of reassigned that stop codon to a tryptophan based on those substitutions that they found. Um, you can't go totally over the top here. So they, you know, they also, they do the reverse. So they take, um, they ask, can we um, go now to yeast and put in tRNAs um, from the, the the version from the trypanosome brucii, the version from B nonstop. Can you put that into like replace the yeast tRNA? And the answer is uh, that's a tough road. So especially if you so if you take the B nonstop tRNA yeast, it's lethal. Yeah. Yeast are dead, and so I think this you know starts pressing because it's not allowing termination of translation, and that's bad. Exactly. And that's yeah. all of your proteins, right? And so that's just yeah. sort of like a, a, a crash event at the ribosome for the viability of the cell. But they but um, they're, they can kind of mess with it a little bit. So if you put the T. <laughs> brucii version, some yeast survive. They aren't growing well. Um, and this is, um, um, again, we won't go too into the depth here, but so this is, they show actually plates of yeast growing and, and how well they grow. And so you can make a, um, a substitution um, a suppressor substitution using the yeast one and getting a little bit of growth under some conditions. B nonstop is lethal. The T. brucii version, so actually, um, and kind of jumping ahead here. So there's um, the, the T. brucii version of the termination factor. If you make a, a knock on substitution there, you can sort of accommodate this tRNA. And so that becomes the second part of the conversion here is not only the tRNA, those that deletion modification. Um, that they're talking about, but there's also, uh, in, so now, you know, the second shoot a drop here relates to the termination step when you actually do get to the end of the peptide. Oops. It's this guy here, this ERF1, right? Perfect. Yeah, exactly. And so now, you know, as you approach the end of the, um, uh, the open reading frame, you've got a, uh, or so, uh, or, or even in these ones that are interrupting it in the middle, you've got to keep the ERF1 away, out. right? Yeah, yeah. Out keep of it out, otherwise it's going to terminate, yeah. Correct. And so you don't want to terminate early. You want to wait until you get to those downstream ones, which turn out to be UAAs 
um, in yeah. some cases, and we'll, well return in, to that in the in the uh, genome. That's where they find as termination codons, right? UAA exactly at the UAA at that where you would expect the end of yeah. the message to be exactly. Yeah. But for these other ones, and UGA in particular, how do you keep that ERF one away? And so it turns out that's sort of an interesting part of the story here too. So not only is nonsense mediated decay out of the game, um, but the ERF, that term, that protein that mimics the tRNA to mm -hmm. say, okay, hey, we're putting in a stop code on now, it has a mutation that's not seen sort of in canonical ERF ones. Uh, again, a highly conserved protein from bacteria to humans um, doing some evolutionary off-roading in B nonstop. And so there's a substitution there. And so this is where that yeast sort of experimental system is really powerful, right? So you basically can put in, um, you know, uh, the T. brucei version of the tRNA that's been modified with the B nonstop change. And then you can, and that then the yeast are, like they don't like it, but you can you can rescue that to a large degree by making the additional mutation to ERF1, meaning that now ERF1 is like, oh, hey, there's a tryptophan going in here. Let's stay clear of this and let the message go to the end where it will, you know, in, in this case, in the yeast um, cytoplasm where um, it, it's it's able to do the, the regular stop codon. Yeah. And so, so with the, the ERF1, that change yeah. is enough so that will recognize the UAA in the in the B nonstop, right? And that's right. go in, but it will not recognize the others. And so you can put in a tRNA with the right amino acid in it. Exactly. And so this is a single point change. Again, it's a it's a mutation in the nucleotide. Serine at position 74 in ERF1 becomes a glycine. And that was that was sort of um yeah, a, a non-canonical substitution that helps to sort of um so, you know, a multi-step evolutionary process here that you that you go through in order to pull off this total recoding to tryptophan that hadn't been seen before. What I'm thinking, Nels, is you could set this up in the, in the lab. You could set up a selection <laughs> to go identify ERFs which have yeah. that kind of preference, yeah. right, for one stop codon versus another. It would be so cool to set that up. <laughs> I agree. Yeah. So how ex especially – so, ex yeah, you and me, like those yeast assays that they show – in their article. I mean, that just has my mouth watering for, yeah, thinking about, okay, let's let those yeast go for a while. Like, so put in, you know, so that's the trick here, right? So it's, how do you make these evolutionary steps so they're not totally lethal? If you go all the way to that B nonstop tRNA, then even if you make that complementary change to the ERF1, um, that if you're dead to start with, that doesn't, that in yeah, this case, it doesn't yeah. rescue. And so as a, an experimentalist, you're sort of like balancing, how do we get the yeast just really sick, but where they can grow enough that as a population, they're sampling mutations. And then right. do you start to get things that grow? Do you rescue that growth? And then because you can sequence the genome of the yeast, then you can ask, okay, well, how did it get there? And so, yeah, you could imagine setting up all kinds of these scenarios, you know, in the first couple of years of your PhD, you could just like, how do I make yeast sick by messing with their tRNAs? And then in the last couple of years of your PhD, like let the, the yeast figure it out, sequence yeah. everything in the last year, you know, say, here's how it did it. And, you know, I think you could learn some pretty cool stuff about uh, the flexibility. So the, uh, the serine glycine ERF1, when they put that in yeast, the, the yeast, are they, they're sick, but they grow, right? Correct. And they grow better. So, yeah. So this is... Without the, t uh, without the tRNA, I mean, just wild type yeast. Oh, oh, good question. Yeah. I don't... So they aren't showing that in the... Um, at least in the main figure. That's probably somewhere hiding in the supplemental. Because that would be your starting. Yeah. You could start with that and then put tRNAs in it, right? Exactly. And so, I mean, but that's going to be... You know, that's another sort of, um, you know, potential obstacle that you would run into evolutionarily is that you can't... Sure. You, you can't mess with ERF1 too much. Right. The fact that B nonstop did, it, that's probably a residue that has some flexibility in it, and that turned out. And in fact, the yeast grow better. But that's sort of, yeah, that's an important control experiment you're pointing out, which is, you, you, yeah. you could also do it ectopically, right? You could have both ERFs in the cell so that under with certain tRNAs, the, the altered one will work and, and yeah. the yeast will, will be able to grow. So all kinds of tricks you can do because as Tom points out, this is the utility of thoroughly studied model organisms. You can do That's everything right. with them. Fabulous. So this, yeah, this is what I love is this plug and play. So you're taking, you know, be nonstop, which first of all, you're probably, I don't know how many of those bugs are out there where you find the bugs and, and, and then you have to get their hind guts or figure out how be nonstop grows. This is already mm -hmm. sort of a pretty finicky beast that has a pretty exotic lifestyle. And so the notion of like kind of domesticating or, you know, scientifically domesticating B nonstop is yeah. 
Yeah. That's probably decades of work, right? So sequencing the genome is already an achievement here. And then seeing this sort of wild um, reassignment of the genetic code is is obviously kind of the main point of this paper. But that's where yeast kind of comes in to save the day. So a lot of, you know, I'd say geneticists, molecular biologists are almost ready to like throw yeast to say, well, we use, it was great. It was a success. We learned about how eukaryotic cells divide, the cell cycle. We learned about this, that, everything, you know, membrane trafficking. We got all these mutants and we did that 30, 40 years ago. We're done. <laughs> but this is like, this is sort of the next chapter, I think, yeah. in addition to the biology we don't know about, but is to then transplant a little bit of this wild biology into these sort of well-behaved lab rats or lab yeasts in this case, and to push the biology even farther. And that's what I, that's really sort of effectively done here um, by the authors of this paper. Okay, so um, that kind of, you know, kind of gets, I think, to the heart of the advances here is like both um, seeing reassignments for the first time, um, yep. proposing the hypotheses and then, and pretty convincingly, um, you know, showing with evidence that, that this is what's going on. We're still left with, a, I think, some major head scratchers here, which is, okay, well, how did evolution do this? Yeah, like, how, did, how do you step through that? Yeah. So let's, let's summarize. So we have yeah. now yeah. all but UIA stop codons are now used to insert amino acids. And this is through a combination of altered tRNAs and altered ERF1. And now uh, you, can, you can use these other stop codons to make proteins. And now... The question is, how did this arise evolutionarily, right? That's the kicker. And this is the kind of yeah. thought I love because it's yep. complicated. And you you can't say this happened first, you just, right? I agree. Like think about it. There, exactly. There's too many steps. It's also a mess. I mean, so it's also, it's a good, um, you know, moment to pause and remind ourselves that, you know, evolution isn't just sort of acting on like you've reached this pinnacle and then you go a little bit higher and a little bit higher. There are all of these off ramps of just messiness. Chaos. I mean, giving up on a, a well-behaved codon, like there must, there must be some pretty, um, well, so there's the, the hypotheses go the, across the gamut all the way from, this is just drift and sort of, you just randomly walk down a dark alley and you get yourself in trouble as a population through bottlenecking, <laughs> et cetera. And fair yeah, enough. Like that. Yeah. That's, I think that's right. And a lot of, that's a lot of, that describes a lot of evolution somehow all the way to a more sort of almost, okay. You know, there are these forces, these selective forces, and then the, um, you know, set of mutations along the way, the individuals in the population that had those mutations, they were just able to sort of pull it off, um, you know, in a messy, chaotic way, but they were the ones who survived the other ones that sort of kept their old genetic codes for whatever environment they were faced were the ones that didn't make it. And that's sort of a selective explanation. I think both, you know, honestly, there's not enough here to totally rule out one or another, but it's always fun to sort of speculate and think about that. So, and that's kind of the first, you know, maybe notion here is, well, um, or, or has been proposed um, by these authors and others is that living that parasitic lifestyle is a pretty extreme environment, right? You've got, so you're, you're in a place where there's other genomes around that have their own sort of hopes and dreams of replicating or of evolving. Mm -hmm. um, and so in this case, it's a bug um, in, in the hindgut of the bug where this thing is hanging out. And so certainly there, that bug's immune system might not be totally on board with sort of yielding its energy and resources to this um, kinetoplastid parasite. Actually, there's a beautiful picture of it sort of in the first sky with these sort of long um, cells with these sort of weird flagellar tails that somehow kind of subs you imagine it or I imagine it subsisting there yeah, in the hind hindgut okay, of the we'll, bug. We'll bring this yeah. up. Here we go. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's pretty cool. I have to make this bigger though. Let's yeah. see here. In the upper corner there, right? Yeah. There we go. Yeah. So, it's, I mean, it almost just looks kind of sad when you look at it. I mean, this, I'm totally over interpreting, of course, now, but um, so that's, you know, an EM at the top there and then some staining, some yeah. H&E staining or something showing sort of the, you know, N is the nucleus, um, K is the kinetoplastid, uh, yep. which is sort of a um, you know, variant of a symbiotic event and then the flagella tail there. And so- Yes, flagella. So what is P and C? Let's look at the yeah, question. Yeah. That's, what panel is that? That's panel B. Okay. So now we go down. This is so blown up that I can't see it very easy. Yeah, panel B. Uh, morphology, scanning EM, and oh, kinetoplast nucleus flagellum, right? Mm -hmm. um, yep. 
They didn't def- define the other ones. Uh, uh, no, there it is. So the um, pro, the pro master, uh, pro master goat, and yeah, the cyst like strap hanger stage. What are we in a in a subway here? <laughs> strap hanger. Yeah. So that that's yeah, funny. Those, those are the cysts, right? So this is like a pretty, you know, this is a pretty comp- complicated lifestyle to live in the hangout of a bug. To pull that off isn't just, you know, the simplest yeah. thing to do. And so, um, anyway, so th- so that's one that's one kind of environmental idea that comes up is that if you've got you're trying to sort of eke it out or figure out an existence here, um, and if being in that environment is already like a massive stressor then do sort of this, do you get on this pathway of mutations where maybe you somehow like that's, that's a way forward somehow, like that there's some, you know, like through the suffering, there's some um, pathway or advantage, not even advantage, but just a way forward relative to the next, the guy around you to, to sort of traverse that, com- those complicated yeah, um, yeah, sort yeah. of parasitic life cycles. Um, I actually, I kind of, I like, a, I like the idea of bringing in parasites, but maybe the, again, like the, now the fleas of fleas of fleas. So, is what's going on with the viruses of yep. these guys, right? And this actually, I think you might hint on this in our um, science picks of the day as well. This could play in both directions. Um, but I think there's some really interesting ideas emerging here about, you know, so who else shows up at your ribosome? And it's the viruses, <laughs> right? <laughs> For sure. <laughs> For sure. I, like, I like that, yeah. Yeah, so whether it's SARS-CoV-2, Yep, or it's yep. HIV, or it's a uh, phage, or whatever. Like the viruses don't bring their own ribosomes. That's another interesting topic. But yeah, and yeah. so they depend on their hosts. And so now imagine that you you can in that population, if there's a mutation where it's like that, you know, that machine where you think you're going to get your proteins if you're you know, like yourself, or if you're um, a virus. All of a sudden, it's like, hold on, all of my, um, you know tryptophans are stop code like all of us you know all of a sudden I'm, I'm going along and i think i'm gonna get a tryptophan but i gotta stop and you know if you're a virus this could be catastrophic and so you could imagine cases where the host might select to avoid the your own ribosome yeah. to be exploited if you can kind of get away with that for a while if you can make that through that might actually be less worse than having a virus a pandemic sure. moving yeah. through your population and wiping it out to extinct extinction if it's you know if it's that sort of a level of an event they no, so I think yeah. mentioned an example with E. coli where mm-hmm. uh, recently it's been shown that codon reassignment led to resistance to a collection of uh, phages that would otherwise kill. So they're speculating maybe, you know, the trypanosomes certainly have viruses and maybe this recoding can be a way of getting around them. And you could easily yeah. test that, right? You could look at, yeah. uh, could you, well, you don't have the genetic tools for be nonstop, unfortunately, right? Because you'd like to re- you would like to revert the whole system, right? Yeah, that's <laughs> Get right. Get rid of the ERF change, make the tRNAs <laughs> yeah. normal, and yeah. see. It's probably going to be lethal, but if you could yeah. get to a point where they would grow, then you could see the effect on viruses, right? That's right. Yeah. So, or you know, I agree. That's a, like a massively high high bar to get through. But actually, so I'd be really curious to start getting a sense of who are the viruses of be nonstop and have they, are they listening in? So you could like, what happens, right? With hosts and viruses, the host makes a move, an evolutionary adaptation. Let's say it's to change the genetic code. Then the virus population yeah, dividing yeah. and like mutating like crazy. Like they might learn how to use that new code through the trial and error, the random oh, I'm mutation sure they would. selection, right? I'm sure they so, would. Yeah. So there's a prediction here, right? So if you start to isolate the viruses of be nonstop, what you'd predict is the ones that are successful, the ones that are in there today, they're, they'll be chalked, their open reading frames will have stop codons in, that are decoded yeah. as glutamates and tryptophan or glutam, you know, right? Yep. So the E's and W's will be, the, the virus will get onto that and we'll just use the modified code. So I don't think anyone, and maybe the authors will have this um, down the road, but, um, or are onto it now, but they don't mention any virus sequences from there. Um, analysis of the genomes, but we have, we're starting to see this in the ciliates actually. So there was a paper that came out, this is, I think maybe about six years ago, seven years ago, a group was in San Francisco, was just sampling um, sewage um, sort of samples and noticed that there is a lot of ciliate hosts or ciliates in their samples, uh, uh, tetrahymena, the model genetic ciliate, and then found some virus sequences that looked like they had stop codons where it's the, um, it's the two of the three stop codons are now 
coding the UAA and UAG are in the open reading frames of this virus. Yeah. And so this, this proposed cilia virus, it's so, so, as far as I know, it's only known as a sequence. It hasn't been domesticated as a virus. There's no virology here yet, but that's like, that's an example of the virus using the ciliate genetic code. You, once you make those sure, changes, sure, yeah, sure. now all the open reading frames work. And so that, at least that's a little bit of evidence that maybe that is what's going on with some of these reassignments is it's a cat and mouse game with the viruses that show up at the ribosomes. Well, just like, you know, back and forth that you study Nels, right? Exactly. Uh, defense systems and counter defense systems, they go back and forth over the years. You could imagine the same thing would happen here. That's right. I think it's really fascinating because you would, in a case that would explain why you, something like a, something as fundamental as your genetic code, that, that would be compromised in order to, to make it through. And, you know, the, the sort of extinction level events um, of a population driven by the viruses that are sort of over exuberant in their um, replication at the expense of the host. Really yeah. interesting. So anyway, so that's, you know, to, to be continued, um, I would say in terms of, and, and that's not, you know, exclusively the only explanation. I think those other hypotheses are still open. So all the way from the drift to sort of these in, ambiguous intermediates, I mean, that's sort of the mechanism and what's driving that in some case or the bottlenecks that might be going on or it could be different in different cases and doesn't have to be either or. Yep. Um, I think to close though, I mean, you, you hinted at this already, Vincent is like, okay, well, um, you know, some of us might be here, you know, an hour 15 into the podcast thinking, okay, why so did what? these, yeah, why, yeah so exactly. What? <laughs> why did these two guys just spend an hour plus sort of really going into the weeds here on this um, thing that lives in the hindgut of a bug? And so you mentioned, you know, this, this notion of synthetic biology. So as we, as these critters teach us how kind of you can tinker with genetics, are there ways that you can imagine sort of deploying some of these things? Um, in, in, in genetic engineering cases. So using suppressor tRNAs, I really love this idea. So of um, thinking about correcting genetic diseases actually by tinkering with nonsense mediated decay. So, you know, mm. so NMD is there, and this has been, this is work outside of what we're talking about today, but um, there's a, a growing uh, collection of papers and groups that are actually ex like, um, you know, directly exploring the possibility of doing this. So the way this works is it's different from um, just the natural mistakes in the transcription process, but this isn't a genetic disease. So there's plenty, you know, dozens of genetic diseases, some rare, some not so rare, where you see that mutation show up again and again. It's a stop code codon early in a, in an open reading frame of a gene. And this is, and the, um, sort of mutated or the truncated protein that you make is the source of the symptoms. It's the, mm -hmm. um, it's the, it's the problem that, uh, the, you know, that's the, the source of the disease. And so, um, using either tRNA suppressors and, or tinkering with nonsense mediated decay, the idea is to just get the, um, get the ribosome to read through. So instead of bringing the terminator there, like, let's get, like, let's actually read this. Now you, the problem is so that, and that's actually turns out to be relatively doable. The problem is it's the same thing with all of these reassignments of, of codons that you see in these cells is that you've then created a, a new problem, which is how do you get the correct stop codons correct? Yeah, right. And so, yeah. And so at first you would think, wow, that's a, like impossible. But I think that's what these creatures are teaching us that actually, no, it is possible if you just get the right combination of things. Mm -hmm. And so this is sort of like, again, you know, like, you know, maybe if nothing at, at the very least, it's like, you know, have the courage to try this as a genetic engineer and see if you can get sort of towards a synthetic biology solution to some of these um, issues that crop up with how the genetic code is working or how you're interpreting mutations, stops and uh, sense and nonsense mutations. Um, and then in some cases, maybe even directly borrowing from some of these mechanisms and putting that in and testing it to see, is there even like a therapeutic threshold here? And, you know, I think the answer so far is uh, we don't know yet. And with maybe some some modest advances, but, um, you know, come back in a few years and maybe um, there'll be progress along that, that those fronts. And I think if, I might be getting this wrong, but there might even be some early stage clinical trials um, starting to mess with some of these suppressor strategies or or messing with nonsense media decay to get read through of an otherwise prematurely um, truncated open reading frame that's the basis of a genetic disease. I think on a bigger level, it just shows you that the dogma is not really dogma, right? You can 
Imagine <laughs> just not three yeah. stop. That don't have to be three stop codons, right? You can do things differently. Just like we learned that information can go from RNA to DNA, we thought it went just from DNA to RNA. So you have to be yeah. open to really profound changes in how things work. And I think, you know, we don't do this as far as we know, but are there other organisms out there that have occupied niches for reasons unknown and they do this? It would be interesting to find out why they do it as well. Yeah, I agree. And also, I think it just challenges your imagination, right? So the idea of, as genetic engineers, why stop at 21 amino acids? And there's a a growing field in sort of non-natural amino acids to, to like expand the code. So you've got 64 codons. Um, yeah. There's yeah. room here to actually expand and imagine and sort of like bringing in sort of um, ways of um, building or testing out proteins that have new functions that maybe haven't or either in nature, but are sort of still kind of hiding out and all the diversity around us or haven't even been that we're trying sort of for the first time in the laboratory. Of course that opens, I mean, that opens, you know, a little bit of Pandora's box in some sense of, okay, well, what are the, if we're starting to, you know, tinker with life or what we think of as the definition of life at sort of that central dogma level, that very quickly gets into sort of philosophical conversations. If you start making proteins that have non natural amino acids, different chemical structures, um, you know, how do you think about that both in terms of biosafety, um, and, or, you know, sort of the ethics of genetic engineering, I think overall it's a pretty safe, I mean, or it's not new ground. It's sort of the same ground that we go on a lot when we think about gene therapy and are we making somatic changes to cells versus germline changes? That's a pretty, pretty bright line in terms of the ethics in that sense. And, um, I don't know, I guess I'm, I'm always reminded again and again of like how nature is just such a more powerful experimenter when it comes to like mixing and matching all of the parts lists and possibilities that are, that are out there, whether it's a virus population or, a, yeah. um, you know, or yeah. more or, or another microbial population, the amount of natural experiments happening like by the day, by the hour compared to like every experiment humans have ever done. It's like, we're still sort of in the, like we're barely scratching the no. surface in the face of not all even, of these natural experiments. Not even yeah. close, right? We, we could make yeah. a couple of changes where nature is making thousands and millions at a time, right? <laughs> That's right. It's no yeah. comparison. Um, let me let me pick up a couple of comments here. Fantastic, uh, yeah. That we can look at. We um, Let's see. Uh, there's a nice description in a Nick Lane book mm. of thinking that the code was two nucleotide mm. before three. Makes sense when you see the details. Yeah, I don't know anything about that. I, I have read the book, but I don't remember. You you know anything about this? And now, yeah, this no, this sounds familiar, and I won't be able to grab the sort of all of the. But what what it reminds me of is, um, you know, sort of kind of re like the in for me the really the um it, it Terry, thank you for bringing this forward. It, it always reminds me that sort of, you know, it wasn't that long ago in history that we didn't know like these puzzles of molecular biology, right? Like just to know is it two, like how many. A priori, could it be, uh, is a codon two nucleotides? Is it three? Is it four? There, I think it was, you know, it was the, um, wasn't it like the polyproline? So like when you start to do polypeptides or mm -hmm. you just put the same letter, so you were able to do yeah. in vitro translation, right? And so, so you, here and, we go. So like yeah. the first ones yeah, were right. poly U because there it was easy yep. and that's phenylalanine, right? And they did exactly. A and C and G and those are easy. <laughs> Yeah. And so then that's like, that was the, that was the trick is like simple. The the way to solve that puzzle was to simplify yeah. the, you know, like the code. Right. And then you could very easily mess with that to get the sort of the right frame or the, you know, the, um, the right register of what the codons are. But yeah, I mean, it could, a priori, it could have been two, it could have been four, it could have, who knows what it was. There's, you know, I think there's some really interesting work going on now. And I have, it's been a few years since I've been tuning in, but is that there's, in addition to the codon, there's sort of the context of the codon. And so is selection acting on a different level? So certainly the codon, that's sort of the core, as we've been discussing, right? To to make the anti-codon binding event and to put on the amino acid. But, you know, in terms of the regulation of translation, could there be sort of a language that's, be, that's written, like, in addition to the three codon, obvious language, sort of a, almost a whisper, an echo in yeah. there? that that also has regulation involved and so some of the um you know newer machine learning etc you know ways of trying to pull out patterns that are beneath the surface i wouldn't like you know it's still the experiment that really to kind of confirm that and the ability to that was the power of the triple u yeah. experiment right was to be able to falsify that with the prolines and or, or whatever the um 
<laughs> or phenylalanine, sorry. Phenylalanine. Yeah, 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 yeah. Was the way to to really nail that down. And so getting that sort of experimental feedback is super important here, I would say. So yeah. this is uh, Life's Greatest Secret, The Race to Crack the Code is one good book about this. Yep. If you want to check that out. Uh, everybody, uh, please uh, thumbs up. We are... Mm. 80 likes, 115 you. Not many, but please give us a thumbs up. Yeah, it gets awesome. us more more attention here. Yeah, uh, thanks, Rob, Bob. thank you so much for your contribution. Oh, wow. Don't forget to check out the new horror sci-fi series, <laughs> The Last <laughs> of Us, where the creepy parasitic zombie ant yes. fungus Ophiocordyceps goes pandemic on humanity. You know about this, Nels? Uh, I haven't watched it yet. It's on my list. I mean, I <laughs> love this idea of right where there's great cases of cordyceps, mostly in in not a, not a coincidence in insects and ants, um, where we, where there, um, you know, evolution's tinkering to do behavioral changes, the zombification of ants and caterpillars and other things. Yeah. So good. Another Thanks, interesting sci-fi infectious disease series in hot mm -hmm. skull, a Turkish series about a mental health condition that is spread by manic talking. Listeners are infected and start jabbering. Oh boy. <laughs> that's a yeah, very that's creative. That's right. some podcast implications there, I think. <laughs> Here is a good one. Who else shows up at your ribosome? Quotable. Yeah, I think that's a good one. Thank you. That's, I think uh, that's... Thanks, Tom. Good to see you here, Tom. Thank you again for, for joining us. Uh, Matt loves the weeds. Well, good for you. That's good kind of what you. science is all about, hanging out there. Thank you, Matt. Yeah. They got the ease to survive by altering ERFs. Should that also be a twofold strategy for reducing side effects, often catastrophic, currently seen on a regular basis with tRNA therapeutics? Yeah, that's right. So I, I don't know. It's not a bad idea, though, right? It isn't. So there, you know, the question becomes again, kind of the um, sort of how well does uh, the model system you choose apply to, in this case, you know, the species that we're most excited about. Um, um, intervening with our, ourselves. And so certainly, you know, the, yeah. So the difference is, mm -hmm. um, I don't know, maybe there's an analogy to be drawn here between like in drug trials, like you do that yeah. preclinical test in mouse and you've cured, like we've cured cancer in mouse, like 20 different ways or a hundred different ways that then when you bring into the clinic with humans doesn't work. And so, yeah, you gotta be a little careful as you're, I mean, I love that approach into, especially if you're learning about what's possible or the concepts, but then as it applies directly translationally one-to-one, -one, yeah. um, our last common ancestor with yeast, you know, this was hundreds of millions of years ago. And there's, even though there's a lot of conservation here, the changes matter too. And so what we learn in yeast might not be directly translatable or applicable, but I think it's a way forward, especially if you can kind of define the question more conceptually and learn something that's like, you know, maybe don't make this specific change, but use this approach in the, you know, in this case, the tRNA therapeutics in a way that makes sense in the human, in that, a lot of ground to cover in terms of, of perfecting that or improving that to make it um, sort of a viable therapy. Code on assignments were not dogma. It was the flow. Yeah. I guess I don't mean yeah. dogma, but just making, you know, saying this is the way it is, right? There are three terminators and it has to be that way. That kind of thinking, just be more flexible about. Um, I, another one I'm thinking of is, um, yep. let's see. Yeah. DNA polymerases don't need primers. Well, we just found some that do need primers, actually. <laughs> so that's the sort of thing I'm talking about here. There's almost a dogma about the central dogma as we've learned, like now that we're, it's like a game of telephone generations yeah, ahead where we, you know, like we get it kind of scrambled. <laughs> yeah. Perhaps yeah. the ERFs and tRNA co-regulate the syntax and semantics expressed in avidity of RNA. Interesting idea here, Matt. I think it's, um, to, yeah, like, you know, this paper, I think, illustrates sort of how, i um, trying to get out of the sun here as the um, sun is coming up on RV Lab <laughs> Studios, but um, the, um, you know, how kind of in our infant, like, I, I would say, um, you know, after, after we learned how information flows through the system, um, a lot of research stopped and it's just yeah. sort of a, a few labs that are picking it up now and, and sort of, you know, how much you can really kind of get into syntax semantics in the, you know, in, including, you know, different sort of combinations of codons or even like, you know, I think I, I saw some work proposing a seven um, nucleotide um, sort of uh, register where there could be some regulatory information in, in those like, yeah. We yeah. just haven't spent much time, I think, really tackling that. And so, yeah, I think this could be potentially a, um, a growth industry. Although your point still stands, Vincent, is like, you know, in some of these cases, like, you know, the biology might be 
right there and fascinating, but uh, convincing peers to give you the resources or a grant to do this is like not trivial to say the least. Well, it's hard because um, money's limited and yeah. people have to make choices. So, uh, but I, I just think you should be a little more creative and flexible and don't demand um, people to write what's going to be the significance of what you find. It's like, who knows? Yeah. Who has a crystal ball, right? Yep. <laughs> I yeah, mean, if you're, gonna make a... A vac- if you're going to make a vaccine, that's fine. But yeah. this kind of research needs to be done. I think you need to do as much of it as possible. As much money as we can put into science research is best. And we don't put anywhere near mm-hmm. enough to get the rewards that it, that it could provide. Yeah, I agree. Diversified portfolio, like a lot of high-risk stuff in there with the sort of safer, direct, translatable pathways as well. I mean, part of the problem is that NIH and NSF answer to Congress and they say, yeah. what are you spending your money on? Bugs that have bugs yeah. in their guts? Are you serious? You know, it's that you that golden fleece stuff that right. it's, bugs yeah. us to this day. So yeah. it's very difficult. I want to thank Kent for his uh, contribution also. Thank you very much for uh, helping to support. <laughs> you know, this is my Thanks, idea Kent. for these podcasts just to have uh, people, smart people, except for me, sitting around having conversations. And that's can't what it enough. is. Yeah, can't get enough of it. Thank you all for being here. Well, Vincent, we should probably move forward with our science picks of the week here. Do you have? Are there a few other comments you wanted to drill into there? Uh, just one more here. Can we yeah, get please. a nucleotides for dummies a chapter <laughs> for codons that code off? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> that's a good idea. All right, I let's do it. some. We can do some picks now. So that's good. That sounds good. So I'll start. Actually, speaking of the ribosome. So if you're If you're um, not already confused about how um, protein translation works, um, (laughs) I've got something, I've got a link here that will make it even more confusing for you. So this is a YouTube um, link to a video, a 1971 movie called um, Protein Synthesis, an epic on the cellular level. This is basically an interpretive dance trying to um, capture... um, uh, how all of this business we've been talking about transcription, trans, how translation in particular works. So this was um, on an open field at Stanford University. Several hundred students convened to undulate and impersonate molecules undergoing protein synthesis by a ribosome. A few were trained dancers wearing <laughs> costumes and colored balloons to identify their roles. Most were recruited with the promise of fun and refreshments. <laughs> but make no mistake, despite the flower power feel and psychedelic strains um, of the Protein Jive Sutra, this is serious science. The narrator is Nobel laureate Paul Berg, who explains the process in a prologue that introduces the leading players, such as the 30S ribosome, mRNA, <laughs> and initiation factor one. So um, it's pretty hilarious, actually, this, this movie. But I, the reason I picked it, in addition to sort of... Um, Re- revisiting sort of the, um, you know, the, the pro- how we learned about the genetic code and how it works um, is I first saw this video as an undergraduate and my, uh, the genetics professor is sort of a big influence on my own career, um, instilled one idea in all of what we were doing um, with genetics and that was fun. Um, and I think this is a great, exp- <laughs> pretty wild hippie um, based expression of that from the early seventies. But um you know, in all these cases, as we're kind of almost naturally floating and talking about sort of, you know, NIH funding and, and all the politics that sort of fall into this, this is, always reminds me to like the sort of expressions of the scientific fun and how central that is to what we do as well. That, that in some sense almost drives our work as much or more so as the funding behind it is that this is fun driven science as well. And that also kind of motivates us being here anyway. So that's my <laughs> science pick of the week. We'll put up the, um, so if you, I think if you search in YouTube protein synthesis in Epic on the cellular level, you'll quickly find that you might throw in Paul Berg, um, who has the, who helped organize this video. Um, you'll find it. We'll also put the, of course, the link direct link into the show notes as well, but that's my, science pick of the week vincent yeah, how about you? yeah oh, yeah but a lot yeah. of people a lot of people recognize this uh video okay. and i do too oh, yeah. there, yeah. there there are a series of these from the 70s and from stanford and berkeley also there's some classic ones a lot of them involving dance to uh <laughs> imitate what's going on so yeah that's, that's right. great perfect choice for this episode right <laughs> that's right yep 
um, all of the messiness of protein translation illustrated with um, interpretive dance. <laughs> <laughs> How about you, Vincent? What's your science pick of the week? So my pick is a paper that we did on uh, TWIM this week in microbiology, 277. The, <laughs> the name of that episode was To Stop or Not to Stop. And um, this is all about recoding stop codons, just like we talked about today. This was a yep. uh, Nature microbiology paper called Widespread Stop Codon Recoding in Bacteriophages May Regulate Translation of Lytic Genes. So what they did in this paper, they looked at 9,400 phage genomes, mm. very much like we talked about in this paper, and found that many examples of stop codon recoding. In other words, the stop codon is now part of an open reading frame. It's in the middle. It's not ending the open reading frame. So yeah. an amino acid has been put in. And so this is quite extensive out of these 900. Um, these are phages from gut, the human gut and the gut microbiomes of baboons, pigs, cattle, horses, and giant tortoises. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they had a final set of 473 recoded double-stranded DNA phage genomes of all different sizes. And what I think is, so they look in the mechanisms here uh, of this. And, you know, one mechanism is that the phage encodes a suppressor tRNA in its genome. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, yeah. it goes in and it's got these, these genes that require recoding. And so the suppressor tRNA is going to do that. And the bacterium can't do it, right? Yeah. Um, yep. They also have some phage genomes that encode tRNA synthetases, right? Which will now, in, in one case, put tryptophan on the TGA suppressor tRNA. So that gives you a, a stop to W codon change, like very much like we saw here today. Mm -hmm. And so you, this phage can come in and turn on this recoding at will, right? And in fact, they also see that the... Um, Use the genomes use alternative code for late structural and lysis genes, right? So um, you can regulate lytic versus lysis uh, or ly lysogenic ph uh, phases of the of the reproduction cycle. Yeah. For example, uh, you can require for lysis recoding that doesn't happen until the genes are turned on later in in reproduction. So you can make some timing with this. So I think the idea that the phages encode either the tRNAs or the suppressors. Hey, who knows? One of them one day might find to encode an ERF that exactly. you know, does things like the one we just saw here. I would not be surprised to see that. So yep. this is very this is quite widespread and quite interesting. And you go on to uh, that episode of Twim, you could hear us talk about it. That's great. Yeah, I need to I need to tune in on this one myself. So this is Twim two seventy seven, and we'll include the link to that one. Yeah, I mean, it's a great illustration, right? The viruses are sort of dancing circles around the ribosome here with sampling all these mutations, gaining genes, modifying them, losing, you know, like, and s somehow, you know, or that uh, implication potentially that you're kind of almost reprogramming the ribosome in a sense for your own specific yeah. um, replication needs at different, uh, it's, it's fantastic. And yep, another sort of glimpse into the possibilities here. We have That's a listener cool. pick from Barbara. All right, Steele, Nels, and Vincent. I just finished Twevo 85, teaching old dogs new genetic tricks. Really enjoyed the topic. Coincidentally, I had started reading a book about behavior of evolution a few days before listening. I have a listener pick for those who wish to dive further into the evolution of behavior. The book is Dancing Cockatoos and the Dead Man Test by Marlene Zook, hmm. or Zuck, a professor of ecology, evolution, and behavior at the University of Minnesota. Maybe Nels knows. I do. Yeah, Marlene was here a couple of years ago um, visiting an incredibly interesting scientist, gifted writer, all of the above. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, the author does an excellent job of explaining how genes in the environment influence animal behavior. She includes very clear examples, good at providing analogies for those of us not experts in the field. Book is really enjoyable read with humor infused throughout the book. I normally stream the Twix podcast while cooking or doing household chores been wondering how i can find out when episodes will be streamed for those also curious i found the calendar for upcoming episodes at the microbe tv website so yes steph our 
One of our moderators has made a calendar, microbe.tv slash calendar, where you can see a schedule of um, upcoming uh, live streams, including here on Tuivo. Uh, we are starting tomorrow a new live stream, which is me. It's going to be called Office Hours. Oh, wow. Very cool. Uh, Wednesdays, 8 p.m. And then once a month, we will go back to Q&A with A and V. Uh, with Amy Rosenfeld and myself, and uh, that will happen, uh, I think it's the 22nd of February, but check the schedule, microbe.tv slash calendar. And continuing with Barbara, mm. uh, thanks for an excellent podcast that helps me see biological diversity around me in a different and fascinating way. I've been a Patreon contributor for a few years and encourage others to contribute also, I so appreciate the time all the Twix hosts take out of their busy schedules to communicate the latest science. Happy New Year. Barbara is in San Diego, where it's currently raining at 57 degrees. Awesome. Thank, Thank you, you so Barbara. much, Barbara. Yeah. Appreciate that. And uh, uh, underlining Dancing Cockatoos in the Dead Man Test uh, sounds like a fascinating book on a great topic. Um, we'll keep live streaming Twivos. That's our kind of go-to. I guess the downside is there'll be little hiccups here and there last week. We were meant to do a live stream, which we had to pull right at the last minute with a kiddo's ear infection, another infectious micro getting into the conversation. But yeah, keep an eye on the calendar and um, we'll try to get, as we continue to organize, get links to our papers or PDFs, whatever it is, we'll get try to get on the calendar and, and keep, the, keep um, stoking the conversation here. This is really fun. And, and thanks again, everyone, to coming to, for coming today. And thank you, Barbara, for Apparently you're, ba Barbara. you're bathed in ethereal light, Nels. Yeah, it's getting hot in here. The I should have brought my put my um, you know um, blinds down before the episode as the sun is moving. It looks like those kind here. of um, <laughs> those lens flares that J.J. Abrams right. likes to do in his movies, right? That's right. I've got lens flares. I'm just getting uh, bathed in in sunlight. But good time uh, to wrap up the podcast. Frank, thank you. Frank's one of our mods. Thanks for showing up. But uh, yeah, hope all is well. And. Um, Thanks, everybody, for coming today. I want to thank our moderators. That is um, Steph and Les and Tom and Frank and our new ones, Barb Mack and uh, PDK. Thanks all for being here and helping out. Appreciate thank the you. time you spend. Uh, and uh, I want to thank all of you for coming because, uh, you know, we had about 120 of you at the peak. It's really great to see you all. Awesome. And uh, come back. And We're going to now come up with a date. But we'll put it on the calendar. Oh, yes, the, the Discord server. I forgot to mention that at the top. Thank you, Les, for bringing that to my attention. Let me, Les, why don't you paste the link in the uh, chat there. But uh, we started the Discord server, which is a place to go and just chat with other people who are interested in the Microbe TV podcast, including this one. Um, but the, they're all there. And um, it's over at Discord and... Uh, Yes, there's a Discord finally. I got it going a few weeks ago. We have an intrepid admin there who is – and and PDK, our mod here, also works with the admin. And they got all the nice channels and so forth. They got it all running very nicely. We have over 400 people. Great conversations there about all things uh, microbe TV, microbial, you know, viruses, immunity, oh, wow. all kinds of microbes and so forth. So um, check that out, folks. Uh, let Les is going to put the uh, link in. I hope, of course, oh, I could put I could put the link in myself because I am a a guy here who can copy link URL. Let's see if that works for me to do this. Yeah, four hundred members, sixty two online right now. This there looks you go. fantastic. Yeah, you should join Nels. People would love I to will. chat with you. Yeah, yeah. I, this is news to me, and I'm, this is looks exciting. Count me in. I'm I've got the link now, and I'll get my act together, get in the mix. Very cool. Mels, thank you for joining me today. Appreciate it. Hey, thank you, Vincent. Great to be together again now for the 86th time and uh, many more ahead. I can't wait for the next time. So that is uh, Twivo number 86. You can find the show notes at microbe.tv slash Twivo. You can send questions or comments to Twivo at microbe.tv or just come to the live stream. We do this live all the time now. Uh, and speaking of live, someone asked earlier, are we going to do live stream TWIV 1000? That's a good idea. That's I will idea. certainly do that um, uh, because it's going to be in a theater and we'll get the guys to do it. Uh, who's doing it. So good idea for those of you who can't come. 
Um, if you like what we do, you can contribute here, but also you go over to microbe.tv slash contribute and support science education. Nels Eldes at cellvolution.org on Twitter. He's L Early Bird. Thanks, Nels. Good to see you again. <laughs> Thank you, Vincent. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. Music you hear on Twivo, which I'm going to start playing right now, yeah, is cranky. by Trampled by Turtles. Where is that? There you go. You can find their work at trampledbyturtles.com. You've been listening to This Week in Evolution, the podcast on the biology behind what makes us tick. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next month. Till then, stay curious. <laughs>